U.S. President Joe Biden hitting the ground running, signing executive orders. He has tailored and planned to help tackle the coronavirus pandemic in the United States. World leaders opened their hearts to new U.S. President Joe Biden looking to renew relations with America. Plus, the number of COVID-19 cases around the world getting closer to a hundred million. It's day two for the new president, Joe Biden, and day one saw him with a stack of folders ready to append his signature to documents that would be executive orders. Ten of them are in relation to the U.S. boosting its fight against the coronavirus pandemic. President Biden aims to give 100 million vaccine doses by the end of April and reopen most schools safely within 100 days. Also for vaccine centers to be established at stadia and community facilities. And outside of the coronavirus pandemic, the U.S. president is set to revoke the policy that blocks U.S. funding to NGOs and aid agencies that perform or promote abortions. President Biden has already signed 15 executive orders. We mentioned on the coronavirus, the environment, and by starting the process of rejoining the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement from which Donald Trump withdrew and ending Trump's travel ban on people entering the U.S. from some Muslim-majority countries, halting the construction of Trump's border wall with Mexico and preserving DACA program shielding undocumented migrants who entered the U.S. as children from being deported. Our correspondents in Washington Maria Bird reports on the key part of the inauguration and President Biden's first day. The 46th President of the United States has been inaugurated. Joseph R. Biden will serve our country. This has been nothing less than historic. All my colleagues I serve with in the House and the Senate up here, we all understand the world is watching watching all of us today. So here's my message to those beyond our borders. America has been tested, and we've come out stronger for it. We will repair our alliances and engage with the world once again. Not to meet yesterday's challenges, but today's and tomorrow's challenges. Vice President Kamala Harris, the first woman of African and South Asian descent to hold the second highest office in the United States, went to work today as she conducted the swearing in of three U.S. senators. Do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that you take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which you are about to enter, so help you God. The ceremonies and celebrations were just part of the Inauguration Day activities as President Biden signed key executive orders. And I thought with the state of the nation today is no time to waste, get to work immediately. As we've indicated earlier, we're going to be signing a number of executive orders over the next uh, several days of the week. And I'm going to start today on the compounding crisis of COVID, uh, COVID-19, along with the economic crisis following that, and climate crisis, racial equity issues. And, you know, uh, some of the executive actions I'm going to be signing today are going to help change the course of the COVID crisis, and we're going to combat climate change in a way that we haven't done so far, and advance racial equity and support other underserved communities. We're going to rebuild our economy as well. And these are just all starting points. As there is much work to be done with many executive orders already in play, the world is watching. From Washington, Maria Bird, Channel Television News. Maria joins us now. She is in Washington. Maria, let's talk some more about the president's first day and these executive orders flying from his table. It's a big shift from the previous administration, which appears to have spread across the country. There seems to be the practice of new presidents, you know, signing the executive orders. And I remember from a president, Barack Obama, on his first day signing the executive order to shut down Guantanamo Bay in one year. So how implementable are these executive orders in the long run? Well, you know, it'll take Senate um, to really um, be in collaboration 
uh, with the president. Um, as you said before, this is something that is quite unprecedented. You see about 17, and we're expecting more over this upcoming week. And so we know that most of this is due to trying to undo many of the policies uh, that were put in place in executive orders by President, former President Trump, um, as many of those items are going to be addressed. I mean, as you as you saw there, you know, mask wearing being mandated um, on federal property. So that's one that will kind of just go into play. Uh, but when you look at issues uh, surrounding the COVID crisis, we look at the economic specifically issues that they are beginning to address, that is going to take collaboration from Congress. I think the executive orders are really a way for the Biden administration to come out strong and to let the American people and the Senate know where they stand and those items that are going to be early on the agenda and ways in which they're going to want Congress to collaborate with them and to have cooperation bipartisanship across the aisles to get a lot of this work done. And this will be the first time in a long time the Democrats rule the White House, rule the Senate, and also the House of Representatives. Does that guarantee the success of the administration in terms of bills that will be issued by the Biden-Harris administration? Well, it will help. I mean, that will be extremely helpful for them, but it will not guarantee. It's such a slim majority uh, for Democrats um, in the in the. House and also in the Senate, that it's not necessarily going to guarantee uh, that we will be able to see much of their work uh, moving through. Again, you also have to remember you have some Democrats that might be, you know, very liberal in their stances or others that lean more conservative. And so depending on what that bill is and depending on what their constituents in their state want to see will depend on how they vote. And so I would assume that we're going to see a lot of things being done, especially as we look at the nominees getting through. That will probably happen very quickly. Uh, but we'll probably begin to see more conversations and more discussions um, within Senate regarding some of these uh, very key issues, as, especially as it looks at how we restart and research the economy. Thanks again, Maria, and do stay safe. Thank you for having me. There is a change in tone around the world as a new leadership takes over in America. Butlers in Europe especially have been expressing an, an eagerness to work with the Biden-Harris administration, while others hope the new U.S. president will help them address some of the biggest challenges. followed by musical honors. The congratulations are still pouring in for the newly sworn-in president Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, but so are the expectations of the new U.S. government. German Chancellor Angela Merkel noted that there is far more scope for political agreement between her country and the United States, and that there will be discussions about how the countries can each best advance their own interests, and Germany, as well as the EU, are going to have more responsibility diplomatically. South Korea's President Moon Jae-in sent his congratulatory message to the new administration while posting on Twitter, America is back. America's new beginning will make democracy even greater. Together with the Korean people, I stand by your journey toward America United. <laughs> the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern also sent him a congratulations. We've been in the um, brilliant position to be able to convey uh, you know, our warmest congratulations as a country directly to um, President Biden when we had that phone call at the end of last year. And so the messages we've conveyed since again have been our warmest congratulations uh, and of course our desire to cooperate. Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison talked about Australia and the United States being the best of allies. Uh, Australia and the United States are the best of mates and the best of allies. Uh, we have been through everything together over a very long time. And uh, this is a relationship between Australia and the United States that has been stewarded by prime ministers and presidents of all political persuasions for a very long time and to the great benefit and the great success of both countries. China says unity is needed in the bilateral relationship with the United States, referring to Biden's inaugural speech. U.S.-China relations worsened dramatically during Trump's term. President Biden is expected to maintain pressure on Beijing but with a more traditional and multilateral approach. And finally, 
Arab leaders have taken to Twitter in support of the new administration, Abu Dhabi's Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Zayed, wished the Biden-Harris administration the best in furthering American progress and prosperity, while Jordan's king sent Biden the warmest congratulations, valuing the two countries' strategic partnership and friendship, while Qatar's bin Hamad wished the new president and his vice president continued success. Let's stay with the new administration in the United States. Let's talk now to a senior advisor at KRL International, a consultant firm based in Washington and longtime congressional staffer focused on Africa, Tom Sheehy. Tom joins us from Washington. Tom, thank you for joining us on The World Today. Now, January 20th was a historic day in the United States as Joe Biden was sworn in as the 46th president. What do you make of his journey to becoming president of the United States? It's been a heck of a year for the vice president. Uh, it was only a year ago or less than a year ago that he finished fifth in a key presidential primary and, and most analysts said he had no chance of becoming president. Well, uh, things obviously changed considerably. We've had a very tumultuous time in our country, both our democracy and, and the process of, of voting. Uh, but now that's been decided and he, he put up his hand and was sworn in as, as the next president of the United States. And, and so uh, we're optimistic. Uh, the country faces many challenges, which uh, President Biden acknowledged. But I believe we're ready to move. And uh, sorry to cut in there, uh, Tom, uh, you were talking about President uh, Biden's uh, journey to becoming president. But what did you make of his inaugural speech? It talks about democracy being back, democracy uh, prevailing in America. We're looking back at what happened just a few weeks ago at the Capitol building. What did you make of his inaugural speech? Well, it struck me as a, as a somber address. Uh, the whole inauguration, as, as you probably know, is... Uh, won't have a lot of the pomp and circumstance and the celebratory aspect of, of a typical inauguration. It's a very somber day here in Washington, and it was a somber address. He was very frank and honest in addressing the problems and challenges that our country and the world face, and he really challenged Americans to, to step up and do their job. So I would say it wasn't a, a speech full of, of platitudes and, and happy talk. It was a somber address for somber times, but I think it was an effective address. The whole world is watching America right now, Tom, and the transition from former President Donald Trump is becoming clearer. How confident are you that President Biden can help the world see America once again as a beacon of democracy and good governance and always looking out for the rest of the world? Rachi, I think he is well suited for, for the very momentous task that, that you just discussed. And I think much of his focus is going to be on uh, repairing the American political system and uh, trying to work and, and, and put some good policies in place and, and address some of the systemic problems we have uh, in our government and democracy. He also is very, uh, he's an internationalist. Uh, he was a, a senator on the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee for the, the majority of his time in the Senate. He values the U.S. role in the world. And I think he'll really be reaching out to other countries, uh, trying to uh, address many of the common problems we have, whether it be on the health front with COVID-19 or, or environmental issues or economic issues, trying to work with African countries to to uh, recover from the COVID crisis and, and regain some of the economic momentum. And so I'm optimistic. Uh, uh, President uh, Trump has some positive policies as well, but uh, there were some very harmful policies. And, and I think we're hopeful that uh, President Biden can, can uh, have a new start and, and really make some good progress. And the world continues to watch America. Tom, thanks again for speaking with us. I'm coming up after the break. What does martial arts have to do with COVID-19? It's helping patients in Russia recover from the coronavirus. Stay with us. Welcome back. China has announced sanctions against former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and 27 other top officials under Donald Trump. Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Hua Xunying says China's decision to impose sanctions on relevant U.S. personnel 
As a response to the wrong actions of these people who seriously violated China's sovereignty, security, and development interests on China-related issues. She says it is completely legitimate and necessary, which fully demonstrates the firm determination of the Chinese government to defend China's national interests. The move is a sign of China's anger, especially at an accusation Mr. Pompeo made on his final full day in office that China had committed genocide against its Uyghur Muslims. Iraq's defense chief has confirmed Islamic State militants could have launched a twin suicide bombing that killed at least 28 people in a Baghdad market today, the first of such attack in years. Iraqi military said two attackers wearing explosive vests had blown themselves up among shoppers at a crowded market in Tehran Square in central Baghdad. There was no immediate claim of responsibility. A hardline Sunni Muslim group captured vast areas of Iraq and imposed its own rule before being defeated in 2017 by Iraqi forces backed with U.S. air power. Suicide bombings were once common in Baghdad but have been rare in the Iraqi capital since Islamic State was driven out. The last deadly suicide blast in the city, also at Tehran Square, killed at least 27 people in January 2018. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson today visited flood-hit Didsbury in northwest England to see the impact of Storm Christoph. The River Mercy, which runs through the area, has experienced extremely high water levels, which have flooded nearly streets and fields. Mr. Johnson thanked the Environment Agency for their defence preparations and efforts to evacuate local people from at-risk areas. But he warned of further rain in the coming days. Well, we're very worried, obviously, about the, the risk of flooding every year. And I've just come uh, here to Didsbury, the Greater Manchester area, to thank the Environment Agency for what they're doing to uh, prepare, but also to help people. As you know, overnight, uh, quite a few people, uh, hundreds of people, got noticed to, to leave their homes because of the risk of flooding from the, from the Mersey. And what I'm seeing here is the uh, amazing preparations that the Environment Agency makes, the, uh, the, the way they're able to use smooth skates, the way they're able to, to use improvised uh, uh, emergency flood defences to protect homes and I think 10,000 homes in the, in, in, in the Manchester area of the Disney area have been protected just as a, a result of what they've been doing uh, overnight. The world is 3 million people away from hitting the 100 million mark of COVID-19 cases, with the number in the United States still the highest the world over at nearly 25 million. Sadly, more than 2 million people have died from the disease worldwide. Countries are still looking to vaccines to help curb spread of the global pandemic. And for the United Kingdom, 5 million people in the country have received the vaccine. Here's a global update. British Health Minister Matt Hancock has lamented another record daily number of COVID-19 deaths, but hails the achievements of the UK's vaccine rollout program. Scientific advisor was asked about this uh, in the media. The health minister uh, says over 5 million doses of vaccine have been administered throughout the UK, with 4.6 million people receiving at least the first of two required shots. In the midst of one of the toughest periods of this pandemic, Yesterday saw 1,820 deaths, which is the highest toll since the crisis began. And as we endure these dark days and the restrictions we must all follow to save lives, we know that we have a way out, which is our vaccination program. And thanks to the hard work of so many people, we now have an immense infrastructure in place that day by day is protecting the most vulnerable and giving hope to us all. Trucks transporting coronavirus vaccines donated from India have arrived in the Bangladesh capital of Dhaka. Many low- and middle-income countries are relying on India for supplies to start COVID-19 immunization programs and bring an end to their outbreaks. Meanwhile, five people have died after a fire tore through a building in the world's biggest vaccine production hub in western India. 
The fire broke out at a plant being built for the Serum Institute of India, SII, but officials say it will not affect the production of coronavirus vaccines. Moscow will relax some COVID-19 restrictions from Friday, including fully reopening colleges and specialist education institutions. The number of daily new cases has started to decrease in Russia, which launched a voluntary vaccination program with the Russian-made Sputnik V vaccine last month. According to a report from AFP, the number of deaths caused by COVID-19 in the U.S. has surpassed the country's military fatalities during World War II. The United States has reported over 24.43 million COVID-19 cases with 406,000 deaths. In the meantime, Dr. Anthony Fauci, President Joe Biden's top medical advisor on the pandemic, has unveiled plans to join the global coronavirus vaccine scheme, COVAX. He also says that the United States will pay its financial obligations to the World Health Organization and remain a member of the global health body. As we end the program, Russian medics in Moscow's hospital number 67 have applied breathing techniques from Chinese martial arts to help COVID-19 patients in recovery. There they are. Patients practice Tai Chi on the territory of, uh, well, this is a tongue twister, Krislatskyov Ice Palace, which was converted into a temporary hospital for people suffering from the coronavirus disease. Alexander Aliyev, who is a doctor and instructor, explained that this method improves the ventilation and drainage of patients' lungs during and after the illness. Patients welcome the idea, he says, and actively participate in the training. And that's the world today. Do remember, wearing face masks and washing your hands is one way to beat the virus.